Okay. And then I will take, go ahead and hit the waiver. And then I'm going to share my screen. I'll take you through some PowerPoints. I'll come on and off. And literally, this is very much like a workshop. Like, like David was saying, like, we want to build your follow-up process. And, you know, it might not be by the end, you'll have some great ideas. The homework assignment is going to be to write out your own follow-up plan. And I'll show you some examples of, of like how I've written mine and what we do for various categories, right? Like, so you have new leads coming in, you have past clients, you've got people in process. And so what's that follow-up look like for that? And if you have any questions, just type them on the chat or hit the raise hand thing and, and go from there. So let me share my PowerPoint. So uh, this just helps me stay on track. So obviously you've seen the, the, the phrases like the fortunes in the follow-up. And for me, I always like to really figure out what does that, what does that really mean for you, your price point, your leads, and what is the uh, kind of dollar value of your time when you're following up on these leads. And so if you look at this, you can quickly on a piece of paper or with your calculator say, how much money did you make last year? And how many leads did you even get? So as an example, I put in here, let's say you made a hundred grand GCI. You don't have to do net. You can do net or GCI, whatever you want to do. But GCI is easier. And let's say you had 250 leads that you got all year long, even though some of those leads in December are closing in 23, it doesn't matter. We're just using the, the numbers as a, as a reference point. So if you did that, that means that every one of those 250 leads, even though they didn't all close, each one had a value of $450. That means that every time you got a name, a phone number, an email, whether it was opcity or realtor.com that don't convert very high, or it was your family member, best friend, or past client that converts very high, doesn't matter where it came from. They all are worth $450. And so the question I always say is, are you treating it that way? Are you treating it like it's a $500 deal? Like the like you send me the name and I'm like, mm, that's worth 500 bucks to me. I better call them quick. I'm going to text them. I'm going to follow up tomorrow. I'm going to shoot them a video. I'm going to send them some sort of a home buyer playbook or benefits of home ownership or this loan program, something to, there's going to be a lot of effort behind it. Whereas if it was, you know, oh, I'm making $5 a lead. That's not as much as $500 a lead. So when you really put a, the math behind your metrics of what you're doing right now, it just puts a more of a value on the effort and the activity that I'm actually doing. And then to go one step further, this is a more intricate one, and I will send the slide deck out to you guys, but this is the, what do you want your income to be? Now, this is a great exercise as we move into, you know, you've got, Roughly, there's like my daughter has a sign in her room. It tells you the days till Christmas. It's it's 97 days till Christmas right now. And that was kind of scary when she put it up on Sunday and it was 99. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like we're almost to the end of the year. And so right now is a good time to think of, okay, I'm still going to do a, a lot of work between now and the end of the year. But what do I want my 2024 to look like? And how many units is that? How much do I make per unit? And so how many units do I need to close to even hit that number? And then as you continue down this slide, how many am I converting on a lead to close ratio? So typically around 25%, maybe in this market, it's a little less. So if we're at 20% or 10% or 50, whatever your ratio is, you can then back into the number of how many leads do I even need to hit my goal? And so what we're talking about is, you know, as I prospect to get my leads to come in, what referral sources do I have now? Like we just talked about farming. Do I need to farm more homes? Do I need to fa farm a higher price point neighborhood? Do I need to farm a neighborhood that has a better turn rate? And how many leads can I kind of expect from that? And then what's that revenue going to look like? And so that's how we can dictate our paycheck for next year. And so as we do, you know, business planning, I do in typically end of October, November, December, and even in January, because for those that didn't do it early enough, because I always say that, you know, sales is a 90 to 120 day cycle. So the calls you're making now might lead to a listing appointment that might lead to then listing the home that might lead to a closing in January, not immediately. So all of our prospecting needs to be done now. So why not set the goal for 2024 
now. Now I can adjust it and adapt it as I get closer. And even in Q1, what's happening with the market? If it's slower, I might have to adjust my activity. If it's going busier, now I have to adjust my hiring for an assistant or an admin or something, showing agents, things like that. But it's all because I know my numbers. And again, this is where the follow-up comes into because I need to build out where do I even want to go and how am I going to get there? And the follow-up is going to put those all together. So let's talk about in general sales. And a lot of you know, I've been doing coaching with the core training and national coaching company for both realtors and lenders for, it'll actually be 10 years in uh, July, June 30th of next year. So it'll be a decade of with them. Uh, since 2017, I've done sales coaching for Grant Cardone, Cardone Enterprises, which is a heavy sales, heavy sales, like prospecting, lead conversion, handling objections, things like that. And that's actually where a lot of this comes from. And then I integrate it with the core. That way it's very realtor specific, not very generic sales like, um, like Grant teaches us. So when we talk about why people actually do or don't buy from us, um, a lot of it, and you'll see some of these objections in here, right? So the lack of time, they don't have time right now, um, personal issues, things that are happening in their life, uh, concerns obviously of cost is a big one right now. So affordability, you know, hey, I want to be in this neighborhood. Like we had one today, they, the price point they want is 450. Uh, they've got 200 grand, but they want their payment to be 1500. I'm like, Okay, your max price point is 370 if you want your your payment to be 1500. So I had to finagle the numbers, but they had to lower their expectations because they want to afford 450, but they can only afford 370. And that's doing buy downs and permanent buy downs and temporary buy. I mean, we I took them all through the math of it, and that's where it was is their concern why they weren't going to buy right now was the affordability. So now I have to have a different conversation with them. Uh, number four, changing of jobs. So they just have an uncertainty of, you know, right now there's an uncertainty of will I have a job? through the rest of this season. And that's a real concern. I had someone the other day, they were like, man, we're doing a next, another round of layoffs and I don't know if I'm gonna have a job. I said, well, let's proceed like you're gonna have a job. I'll pre-qualify you, we'll get you ready. When you when when you survive the the layoffs, not if you when you survive that, we'll revisit it. And then if you feel comfortable, you can go out shopping and David or Helen or Lauren will take you out to see the homes. That's it. Uh, number five, not the decision maker. So one of the biggest questions I always ask, but as a salesperson, you want to ask is, hey, are you the only one that's part of this process? Even if they're applying by themselves or they're single, I always ask, is there anyone else that's going to be party to the decision? Meaning, is it are your parents going to help out and you know want to read through the contract? Want to read through the buyer broker agreement? Want to read through the listing agreement? Want to read the loan application? Uh, I once had a gal who said, yeah, my dad is an attorney in Texas. And I said, this is good to know. And I'm like, great, your, your attorney dad in a different state wants to read through the loan application. This is going to be a fun process, but at least I knew what was going to happen, right? Uh, or, you know, hey, my financial planner is going to want to talk to me about this. Great. This, this lets me head it off and say, hey, let's book a Zoom with myself and you and your financial planner. Or, hey, why don't you and your financial planner come to my office? I'd love to meet another financial planner because if I can wow them, and take care of the client, they would be more apt to refer me to their other client. So knowing who are all of the decision makers. And I don't know if you you see this. I think salespeople are definitely more educated now, but I had someone calling me about some app or something they were trying to sell me. And they said, um, you know, are you committed to show up for the call was a question. And they said, are is there anybody else that would be involved in the decision making process of moving forward with any packages that we present to you? Great question to ask, right? So it's how does that work in our business and where does that come up in your process? And again, this is all part of follow up because if I don't know that there's somebody else and I'm, I'm taking my time and I'm going through my listing presentation or my buyer presentation, and then all of a sudden that comes up, it now changes everything. So if I know it up front, it will make it easier for the follow-up process and it'll make you work more efficiently with that particular lead rather than adding extra time that didn't really need to be added. Uh, number six is wrong product. Now, obviously wrong product could be the agent that texts me today for the client for a 450 house that really can only get a 370 house. So that's a, hey, I'm showing them homes. I'm taking them to six homes on Saturday, all for 450, maybe even 500. Great, but you're on the wrong product. 
you're in the wrong area of town. They can't afford it. Or my clients that we do a lot of investment properties and we do that debt coverage loan. So it's the DSCR loan. It's the, will the rents cover the payment of the mortgage? And I, I'm like, great. We need to do the math first so you know where to look. And I need to tell you where to look that has no HOA because the HOA will blow the deal if you find me the 450 house in a rental area that has a payment that'll cover $3,500. And, but then you put on an HOA and now it doesn't cover and you blow the deal. So making sure that I have the client on the right loan product, but then you, we're showing them the right area of town, right type of home, that product. And then number seven is just, they're just not ready. And, the, and it could be any of those reasons right there and more. They're just not ready right now. And a lot of it can be the misinformation of the media that's out there right now that you all know of, the mixed messaging that people are hearing, the, the unknown of their job or the economy of the market itself, what's happening in commercial real estate, things like that. Now, I'll tell you, this is a powerful slide. I'll let you kind of digest it, right? So that number one, 2% of all sales are made on the first contact, meaning Helen sends me a deal. I call them up. There's a 2% chance that I'm going to convert them to even working with me, take an application, moving forward, set an appointment. 2% that on the first try, I'm going to get them. 3% on the second try, 5% on the third, 10% on the fourth, 80% will happen on the fifth to 12 contact. So what that tells me, David, is that every follow-up plan that I need to build has to be north of 12 contacts. There has to be at least 12 touches in any of the things that you are doing. It could be even be after the sale, right? You're, you make a 30-day a post-closing call to your client to congratulate them on the house, ask them if they need anything, landscaper, housekeeper. Do you need me to send my handyman over? Did the, did the movers ding anything up? Is there anything that needs a fixing? I got a guy for you. That, that's step number one. Uh, maybe I swung by the house three weeks after the close to hand them the closing gift. Because if I give it to them at the closing, there's so much going on. Their head's still spinning. They still have to now think about packing and moving and everything, setting up utilities, all this stuff. And then here you are, you give them a nice little package. They're like, thanks, I appreciate it. And then it's just thrown in a pile with everything that's moving into the house. Versus you wait three weeks for the dust to settle. Things have calmed down. They've moved. Everything, ah, we feel a lot better. And then, hey, I just want to swing by the house and see how you're doing. I have something to drop off. When are you going to be around? And then you swing by the house. And now they're just in a better mood. And now it's more memorable when I give them the cutting board with their name engraved in it. Gale family established 2023. Here you go. Cool. Hey, walk me around. Wow, I love what you've done with the place. Oh, I remember. Oh, that's cool. That's exactly where you wanted to put the couch. That's great. Hey, what's the next thing you're going to do? Oh, you're going to paint? Do you need me to refer you to a painter? So these are another contacts, the text, the 60 day call, the 90 day call, the six month call, the one year call, you're building in this follow up plan that has to be 12 touches, could be a handwritten note, could be a little video, could be a market update, could be home bot. Hey, I've signed you up for a system. That way, I know you're going to get your mortgage bill in the mail, but I want you to get a financial statement, kind of like a stock if you had a stock or investment, a 401k, you'd want to at least be getting a quarterly statement that tells you where your stocks and bonds and you know your retirements are at, right? Yeah, sure. Cool. Not many people do this, but I've signed up for a service. I pay for it myself. It's free to my clients, and I'm going to send it to you every single month. It's a financial statement for your house, and it's HomeBot. Keep an eye out for it, and then you make sure you're getting it. It's the highest open rate of anything that I send or in the industry that I've ever seen opened up by clients, like north of 80%, right, David? I mean, it's just, it's just ridiculous. Okay, so this slide though is the most, is builds the framework for me because I always think like it can't be, well, I call them a couple times, I send them a text, I send them an email and they're just not getting back to me. They must not really want to buy. It's okay. They'll come back to me when they're ready. And then you just leave it at that. Well, that's not how you guys are rolling because you're here today. But how you want to is, dude, I'm going to hit them until I like jokingly get a restraining order. Like, wow, this kid's so persistent. I'm going to fade. Like we hit them with a call, a text and an email right away, later the afternoon, tomorrow. And then it's like two days later, the next week, hey, just checking in. Hey, David's a great client of ours. We just want to make sure you're taken care of. Let me know when you're free. I'm being pleasantly persistent. And I'll fade from it, but it never goes away. 
Maybe it goes to once a week, then it's twice a month, then it's once a month. Hey, I wanted to invite you to my home buyer workshop. It's just lower in the bar, no intrusion. Come on in, lower the guard. But there needs to be a multiple step process. Even if it repeats, it's okay. You just need to have more than 12 steps. Okay, one of my favorite quotes, 100% of all leads will buy. If they raise their hand that they want to buy a house, they clicked on your link, clicked on a domain, opted into Zillow, hit realtor.com, hit op city, whatever they did to get you to you, referred from the hairdresser, referred from the personal trainer, referred from the financial planner, they will buy. It's just a matter of what are they going to buy is one, right? Are they going to get the new iPhone that comes out on Friday? Or are they going to keep the thousand dollars and use it for their down payment on the home? Are they going to buy and go into a rental instead of buy because they didn't want their credit pulled and they didn't think that that they thought they needed 20% down and they didn't know that they were, since they're a veteran, they get 100% financing or because they're in a USD rural area, it's 100% financing or that there's a new down payment assistance program that has no income limit, no income cap. They can buy no matter how much they're making. Now, maybe they can't buy right now, but they will buy in the future because they couldn't afford it or they don't have the money or whatever it is. But will you follow up with them until they do buy? Or is it, okay, well, just let me know when you save up the money, when you make a decision. Uh, you know, hey, when when you see the, the media say um, that rates came down, you can call me. Like You can never leave it to them. We always take 100% responsibility. All right, some best practices for when you're building your plan. Collapsing time, meaning you've seen the slide. I actually have it here in a different presentation. Oops, oops, wait, there we go. In a different presentation, it's uh, it's the um, how the conversion of a lead, and I'll email this to you guys, but it's the conversion of a lead for speed. And so it's 78% of business to business customers purchase from the vendor that responds first. 78% responding within the first five, the first minute increases lead conversion by 391%. Responding within five minutes is 21 times more effective than responding after 30 minutes. So someone hits your site, hits your Instagram, sends you a DM, I'm looking to buy a house and you respond within a minute. 391% increase in conversion. Within five minutes, 21 times more effective than if you waited five or 30 minutes. That's crazy. So I know it sounds like a lot of stress, but you got to make sure that either you or someone is watching your emails, you or someone is watching your texts, you or someone is watching your messaging platforms. If you're, you get a lead on your CRM, it better send you a text message. If there's a lead through your website, it better like notify you on your phone so you can immediately go click, hey, I'm here. And that goes to the be first part. Be first. Be last. Now, be first means be, be quick. So you're part of that 391% conversion. The be last is where I want to make sure that I'm making a, a lasting impression, but I'm continuing to follow up. Again, pleasantly persisting until I get the restraining order. And then the last one is never rely on one form of communication. The reason I say that is, you know, you guys have the phones, right? I can call them, I can text them, I can email them, but look, spam rates are at an all time high with spam filtering. Like I have a, an app called Umail on my phone. It's where if you call, your voicemail gets transcribed into an email and sent to my team. Well, that service also blocks spam calls. There's also a feature on your iPhone where you can block spam calls. Well, I don't know if the clients are net seeing me as spam if I'm calling from my corporate office, my landline. I don't know. I always call from my cell phone, but that doesn't mean that something couldn't be spam. So following up with a text message that says, hey, Helen, just left you a voicemail. You inquired on our site. Let me know a good time to chat. Send. And then maybe I wait a few minutes, just making sure you got this. Maybe I send a Helen question mark. I have a policy here that anytime that anyone sends an email, they have to send a text message that says, just sent you an email. Sometimes we go to spam, just wanted to make sure you got it. Especially on the initial conversation, because if they get the initial one, 
or at least you text them and they find your initial one that went to their spam or junk or some filter, like Gmail has new filters now on their Gmail. And again, they think from, from a client perspective, that's helping them because it's filtering their email. From a sales perspective, it's hurting us. So we got to make sure that we don't rely on one form of communication. Same thing with um, text messages. I can text, but I could also send a video. Hey, it's Helen. So I wanted you to put a face to the name. I'm so excited that you hit my website. I look forward to taking you and touring that community. Let me know a good time to chat. Send. And now it's more personal. It's not a text. Maybe it's a voice memo. I've been having more people do voice memos, talk to text on the on the the um on the text. So they they click the little microphone button, they record a message and it sends it to me and now I'm listening to their voice on the text message. And like, oh, that's cool. A guy sends me a scenario today. Hey, do you do ITIN borrowers? Let me know. It's probably easier for him to do that, but it was different. And again, I'm, I'm obviously remembering it because I'm just bringing it up. That stuff just happens. Okay, so those are things to remember when we talk about the follow-up. Okay, uh, let's see. Mistakes in the follow-up. Now, obviously, I know you guys aren't part of this club, but this is, again, a national study with Salesforce. Salesforce is one of the top CRMs. And they said, people that just never make the phone call, <laughs> like never, like the call's there, the lead comes in, and they just never call. They never make an attempt. Number two, frequency leads to greatness, that you're frequent and consistent, the next one, with your follow-up, that you are uh, the frequency means I'm going to call, then I'm going to text, then I'm going to email. Uh, if it comes in before noon, I'm going to do it again at about four o'clock, see if I catch them on the drive home. Um, uh, I'll call it first thing in the morning so I can call, text, email, maybe get them to do an application on their way to work, right? Number four, waiting too long to follow up. That's exactly what this study shows right here. If I wait between the first minute to the five minute mark to the 30 minute mark, that's a big loss of income for us. And how much more difficult is the follow-up when that lead first came in and there's the version of you that called right away. And then there's the version of you that waited 30 minutes. The first one is going to convert at a very high level and be able to manage more leads. The second one is going to have a harder time. And I always think that within that 30 minute gap, how many other sites did they hit that they might be getting phone calls from that now I'm not the first person they talk to. And now I'm trying to win them over. And now my follow-up is turned into more sales that I'm just trying to get them to even attempt to have a conversation or meet me or come to my office for a buyer consult or whatever it is. It just makes it more challenging. Number five, lack of variety. If every one of my calls is, I'm just calling to see if you're ready to apply for your mortgage and for me to pull your credit and send me a lot of documents. Okay, bye, click. Hey, I hope you're having a great day. It's Greg, just seeing if you're ready to apply for me to pull your credit and send me a lot of documents. Okay, okay, bye. If I just keep doing the same thing, it's redundant. But what if I said, hey, I know the Fed is meeting tomorrow. There's some big news happening. Hey, call me and I'll get, kind of give you the breakdown of what we're expecting. That could be a call today. Tomorrow, hey, the Fed met. Here's what was the, Here's the announcement that happened. In two weeks, hey, I'm just calling for this. There's got to be another reason, not just the, hey, I'm just calling to see if you want to apply. I'm just calling if you're ready to sit down for that buyer consult. You know, what if I called my, my clients, I look at my CRM and I go back to January and February. Now, locally here, we've seen appreciation at 0.8 to 1% a month. Hey, I know that we didn't connect in January. Man, I really hope you bought a house. You were looking kind of in the $500,000 range and you'd probably have about thirty dollars to $35,000 in equity right now if you closed in January. So man, I really hope you did. Hey, if you didn't, please reach out to me. I'd love to consult because I don't want you to lose any more money. Give me a call. That would be a catching call today where someone's like, what do you mean? Allah? I had a conversation last week with someone that didn't call, do it in January. And uh, they're like, yeah, I just, you know, life got in the way. I also thought that rates were going to come down. I thought prices were going to come down. And I'm like, yeah, that didn't happen, did it? She's like, no. And I said, well, look, I mean, you probably lost about 30 grand in equity and now the houses are more expensive. So I don't want that to happen to you again. How fast can we get through the process of getting you pre-qualified to get you out in the car with Alex so he can take you out shopping? And they're like, what do you mean I lost money? I go, well, here's the nut. And I showed him the numbers and everything and showed her the forecast. She's like, wow, I didn't see any of that on the news. I go, no, that's not where you're seeing it, right? Because that's not a good enough 
uh, clickbait for them. They need to say they need to say crash is coming, crash like 08, foreclosures are up, crash, crash, crash. That gets clicks. That gets advertisements. She's like, oh my gosh, they were pre-qualified within 24 hours. Like sent me their documents out shop and ready to go. Because of the variety of the reason of my call and the variety of the conversation. It's just got to be different. No clear purpose for the call. Something the grant teaches all the time is you say your name, you say where you're from, and you say the purpose of the call. Hey, it's Greg with Nova. The reason I'm calling today is this. Hey, it's Greg with Nova. The purpose of the call is to go over this. Hey, it's Greg. The purpose of the call is you just closed 30 days ago, and I'm just seeing if you need anything. Do you need any referrals to a painter, landscaper, roofer, arbalist, pool guy, AC guy, whatever? You let me know. Between David and I, we know a lot of people in the subcontracting world. You ever need anything mortgage or real estate related, please let us know. We're here for you. We weren't just here for the sale. We're here forever. I'm here to do your next house. I'm here to do your investment properties. When you're ready to start building more wealth in real estate, let me know. That's a great call. Different. It's a different variety, but it's also, I state the intention and purpose of the call. Big mistake, not leaving a message. Now, the only time you're allowed to not leave a message is if you're going to call right back. It's called the double dial. I don't know if you've ever had this, right, where your phone rings and then it stops ringing and then it rings again from the same number. That's called the double dial. It's a sales tactic. They say the pickup rate is over 74% increase when you do the double dial. So if I call someone and it goes to their voicemail, I hang up and I call again. 74% increase in the fact that they will pick up the call because they think something's wrong. They're like, hello? Oh, hey, it's Greg with Nova. The purpose of my call is Helen, Helen referred you. I want to take great care of Helen. That means I want to take great care of you. Is now a good time to talk about buying a house? Is now a great time to talk? Is now a great time to review your goals? Like whatever the message is, but I'm talking to them. Now, if they don't pick up off the second dial, then I'm just going to leave a voicemail. Hey, it's Greg. I'm calling because you were introduced by so-and-so. You hit the website. Wow, I'm so happy that you did that. You went to their open house. Of the 50,000 agents, you walked into their open house. That's awesome. Congratulations. They're great. They really know the market. They're a master negotiator. I want them on my side of the table, not the other side of the table. Man, you're in great hands. Let's get moving forward. Do you have a house to sell? What's it? What are you looking to do? What's your time frame? Like I just roll right into it. But that you always leave a message with whatever you're doing, unless you're doing the double dot. All right, number eight, not collecting critical information. Look, there's nothing more annoying to me than someone asking me a question that they already asked the last time. Hey, Greg, um, so what is your timeline for buying a house? Well, um, David, when we talked last week, I told you I needed something by the end of the year. That's annoying. But if David's like, hey, I know you said you need something by the end of the year. I had this off market coming. I'm going to meet the guy to sell his house. I, I don't even think it's going to hit the MLS, but it sounds like it might hit your criteria. Did you talk to Greg yet and get pre-qualified? Um, no, I thought I had more time. You don't have more time. You want to close by the end of the year? I got to get you out shopping now. Okay, I'll call Greg. I'll tell you what, I'm just going to live transfer you to Greg right now. Please hold. Beep, 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 beep. Boom, right? But you have to have that. If you called after the closing and you call me and you say, hey, Greg, hey, just checking in. How's the house? Hey, uh, hey, I remember you said you were traveling and going to Florida. How was the trip? Wow, you remember that. Hey, I remember you telling me about your daughter in gymnastics. Is it meat season? It's coming up. That's so nice of you to remember. I feel like we're in a relationship, not mechanical, transactional, where you're always trying to start something every time you call me. How you been? How's the family? That's great. And I just keep telling you the same thing every time. What if you pick up the conversation? Hey, I heard you were taking a trip out to, to, to Europe. How was it? What was the top sites? Where'd you end up going? I'd like to go there. It's on my bucket list. I hope to get there within the next five years. I'm just trying to save up. Wow, where'd you go? That's great. Did you have a little itinerary? Can you send it to me? Wow, that'd be awesome. And then the next time, hey man, you know that itinerary you sent me? I took my wife out to dinner. We went all through it. I think we're going to accelerate my plan to go. Wow, that's cool. Like it just, it just feels more like a relationship. So collecting that data, but you got to put it in a CRM and that's where number 10 comes in. But number nine, before I go, number nine, always asking for a referral. We're in sales. Who else do you know that's looking to buy a house right now? Now, it's not, do you know anybody else? Because that's what's called a closed-ended question. Do you know anybody else? No, no, I don't. 
Like it's just, it's, it's going to roll off their tongue before you're even done asking the sentence. But if I said, Hey, Helen, who else do you know that's looking to purchase a home right now and invest in real estate like you just did? Who else do you know at your office that might be looking for a house right now? Who else do you know in your family? Like it's specific, but it's also open-ended question. Like for you, who else do you know that reached out to you in January? Who are the three to five people that you talked to months ago that decided to put it on hold that you need to reach out to right now or I need to reach out to right now and have a conversation of how much they lost and how much they're going to continue to lose if they continue to wait. I call it the cost of waiting. And then number 10, I already mentioned it, but you got to have a CRM. You got to have somewhere where you're putting all the information because that's how the follow-up happens. I go in, I click on the dashboard and it's like, oh, here's all the people that I need to reach out to today. Here's all the people that have birthdays this week or this month. Look, I have a list on my desk right now of October birthdays. So my assistant prints this out for me and I got to go through and say, who is getting a gift? And I go through and we mark it and I just have a system around it. But that's part of my follow-up is gifting on birthdays. What is the gift? Is it a card? Is it a card and a cupcake? Is it a gift? What is it? What's the price? And we just go through and every single month. And she actually does it in two week rounds because it's just too much to handle with all the clientele and the VIPs and all that kind of stuff. Okay. But that all had to be organized through the CRM. All right, let's talk more about tools. Obviously, you have the fo the phone call, you got the text message, you got the email, you got handwritten notes, you got ha handwritten notes, personal visits, drop bys to their house, drop bys to their work. Man, especially if they work at a company where there's other people. Like if you closed a deal for a a dental hygienist or a dentist, why wouldn't I stop by there? Hey, I brought you guys an edible arrangement of all fruit. Notice I didn't get the chocolate covered stuff for you guys. Here you go. Hey, how's everything going? I just want to say hi. I was in the neighborhood. Hey, what's going on? Personal visit. Maybe it's a maybe I just dropped that gift off and they're not even there. And like, oh, who brought that? Oh, it's David, my realtor. Like, oh, well, oh my gosh, that's funny. We we're, were thinking about listing our house. How was your experience with David? I totally forgot. And here it is, top of mind again. Gimmicks. Like that, that can be a gimmick. Um, dropping off the little pumpkins, that's a gimmick. The apology contact. Hey, you know, I'm really sorry in January. I, I tried to do a, a good job presenting why you should buy. And I, and I know you didn't. And I'm, I'm just sorry because now you've missed out on the equity that you could have had. And I don't want to have that happen again in six months. So when can we meet and sit down and dive into the numbers to get you in the game of real estate so you can start getting all this appreciation that unfortunately was missed since you didn't close in January? I just pulled up the house you were actually looking at and it's up $30,000 in price. So it's more expensive. And, you know, as, as you know, as rates come down, that price is going to continue to go up and the seller concessions are going to go down. You know, you all have people right now. And so do I, that will not be qualified when rates come down, which sounds opposite, right? But I have people right now that are qualified, can go buy a house right now because they're getting seller concessions, because there's a possibility to get 10 grand. They're not going to save 10 grand when the rates come down. They're magically not going to have $10,000 saved up. So that's those are people that are in your database and in my database that I need to reach out to and let them know that. And not from a, hey, man, I'm just trying to pressure you so I get a commission. Look, I'll close your house at some point in time, sometime. I just know that you don't have any money saved up or enough to cover the closing costs to get you into a house when the rates come down because the closing costs go away. And by the way, let's say the closing costs are 10 grand. Maybe they're eight grand. How about when it gets really bad, like in, in 2020 and 2021, when you had to bid over ask. And so now they're coming out with another five, 10. I mean, we had someone that was 150 grand, it was a $3 million house, 150 grand over, over. Now the, I was talking to the guy today, 3 million that's worth four right now. Was it worth the 150 over? Heck yeah. Was it hard at the time to convince him? Heck yeah. But he knew. He's like, dude, I see where it's going. Oh, great. Now, mostly those, those, that price point are kind of savvy, typically on the investment side. So when you're sharing the numbers, they're like, yeah, I get it. I see where it's going. Okay. Even if it dips a little bit, it'll come back. Okay. You're right. And they were right. Okay. Cell phone video messages. 
pinging people on social media. Look, I, when I get people's names, I look them up on Facebook and Instagram because if I can find them and then DM them there, it's just another contact, another touch. They say that it's seven to 11 touches for someone to start to build some sort of trust with you. And so that means if they got a voicemail from me, if they saw an email, if they got a video, if I slid into the DM, if I got them on the Facebook and they're like, wow, like this kid, they, hey, they're like, this kid's everywhere. But then the, there also seems to be a little more credibility. There's also a little more, wow, this guy really cares. Again, if it's pleasant, if it's berating and salesy and cheesy, then you're going to turn them off. But if it's, hey, I'm just here to help. Hey, I'm here if you need me. Let me know what information you need. Here's a great article I just saw. Here's something about household formations versus creations, why demand is just continuing to rise. When people think the economy's slowing, it's pretty crazy, but this is what happens with real estate. And historically in a recession, other than the, the housing crash that caused a recession, Every single recession in history has had rates come down and housing stabilize or go up. So housing's never crashed because of a recession. Housing caused the recession during 08, but every other recession that we've ever had economically has had stable to increase growth in appreciation and rates have come down. So like, I, I, I know recession is not good for everybody, but it's good for us. Okay, sending photos. Um, I have a gentleman who shoots videos of various homes. He'll go to the homes, a three two, a four three, um, you know, the little the little um RV gate, you know, house with an RV gate. And then when he gets a lead that says like how they came in, they're looking for a three two or whatever, one of his follow-ups is to send them a video of a property. Hey, I was touring a property and thought about you. Now there's a video tour. He just got saved in his phone. Now there's a video tour of a home recently viewed that goes right to the lead and leads like, wow, I guarantee if someone hits a website, they're hitting other people's website and they're probably information is being sold to more realtors and lenders. So they're having multiple conversations. You have to stand out. So when you send the personal video, when you send the video of a walkthrough of a house, when you send the, the loan product, when you send the email to an article, a link to an article, the testimonials of your past clients, it's a layup. Think about the restaurants when you go to visit somewhere. You always look at it and you go, How, what's the rating? Like if I look at a restaurant and even if you recommend it and I pull it up and it's a two out of five, probably not going. I appreciate the recommendation, not going. I, we're, I booked a hotel. I'm going back to Boston to see my family and my wife. And I go, hey, I booked this hotel. I can cancel by the 9th of October. Uh, but I just booked it because things are heating up out there. I can't, I can't find anything. She said, okay. She looks it up. She goes, Ooh, it's a 4.4. That's good. I said, okay. And she and then she's randomly going through the testimonials. And she goes, listen to this one. It says, I wouldn't stay anywhere else in Boston. And I go, well, she obviously didn't have the money for the Ritz because the Ritz is right down the street from where we're staying at the Long Wharf. And, and she, she laughs and I'm like, but it's a good testimonial. So like, for example, for me, when I send out the prequal sheet to you for your client, I attach a resume with, there's like five... There's five or six agents on there with testimonials of me and my team. I've worked with Greg Gale, uh, you know, thorough communication on it, close on time, like just testimonials from them, real testimonials that I got from them. And then I just put them in an image so that when you submit your proposal, it has a testimonial on it to the listing agent because I want to get the offer accepted. Well, why wouldn't you send your resume to your potential buyer because they're interviewing agents to hire? Until they sign the buyer broker, which even that doesn't hold a lot of water, but it holds more than none, you should be bidding for the job. So think about newsletters and blogs. You know, you can go onto Google and have a Google alert set up for real estate Phoenix. And then any real estate articles that get populated for Phoenix or Queen Creek or Santan or wherever you market, Agricopia Gilbert. And then anything that pops up with that, I can then take that link and send it out to Leeds, Sphere, anywhere. I can decide how to repurpose it. Testimonies we just talked about and then surveys, right? Like doing surveys. Hey, what, what's your timeline? Zero to three months, three months to six months, nine months or longer. Send a survey out to your leads. If you do a lot of internet leads, you probably have a like a mass amount, like they're in a pond somewhere with a team. And like, great, I'll call those leads. I'll mass text them a survey and ask them their timeline. I'll ask them if they bought a house. 
people like quizzes and surveys for some reason. I don't know if you, you notice that on Instagram and stuff, but people do a lot of stuff with the instant, with the surveys and, and, and quizzes, they like them. So if I can do a short quiz that takes them, uh, makes a big step, a shorter step to get them more engaged, I'm going to do that. Okay. Be so persistent that you stand out as the only choice. Be so persistent. That you, like, I just know that there's other lenders calling people. There are other lenders calling you as realtors. There's other lenders calling my clients. There's back solicitors. The second I pull someone's credit to pay a dollar for your information, your client's information, to then start spamming them with 20 phone calls in a day. One of my really good friends, she's like, oh, Greg, I kind of wish I didn't start this process. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And she's like, I got like 20 calls. I'm like, are you serious? She's like, look, I had to block the number. And then I get another, a different call, same company, different number, because the last four digits changed, but the other, the first area code and prefix are the same. The last four change because they know people are blocking them. And I'm like, oh my God. And like, wow. And now I've told, she goes, I know you told me that that was going to happen, but I just didn't think it was going to be that bad. I was like, oh, it's that bad. And it was like five days in. So they were still hammering because they paid money for those. So I need to stand out as the only choice. All right, the last couple of slides here, traits of being a master, super organized, you're planned, you're creating. Notice all the ideas I'm throwing out for ways to follow articles and videos and what to say. You gotta be creative. Maybe you're creative through using chat GPT. Maybe you're creative through watching other people's stuff, how they follow. Like I love when, like I'll opt into stuff just to see what people's follow-up is like. I'm looking to see how the restaurant's marketing, how the dry cleaner's marketing, how crumble cookie markets. Like I literally want to see their marketing and like, wow, that's engaging. Or, ooh, I would never do something like that. Like I'm very critical about that stuff, but not judgmental. I'm critical like, like critiquing wise. Like, man, that's a good idea. I'm going to do that. Being very strategic, persistent, patient, professional, unbothered, unreasonable, committed. I mean, these are all just traits you got to think like, who do I need to become? to be ridiculous with my follow-up. And those 10 traits are what you need to be. Unbothered, meaning they're not calling you back. Don't get, oh man, they must not really want it. Screw them. That can never be the attitude. It's more like, God, they must be getting hammered with other people. I bet tomorrow they'll pick up. Maybe they'll reply. Maybe they'll check out my article and on month six, they're going to pick up the phone and go, hey man, you just follow up more than everybody else. Yes, I do. You've provided more value than anybody else. Everyone else is just calling me, texting me. Are you ready? Did you buy a house yet? Let's go. Call me. Come to my office. Versus you've been adding value. What's happening with the Fed? What's happening with the market? What's happening with household formations? Come to my home buyer workshop. It's free. I'm doing this thing at the library. Home buyer workshop. It's going to be me, a lender, a title rep, a home inspector. A come, come learn about buying a home. I have a stager that's coming on Zoom to talk about staging a home to make the most money uh, fast, fa close fast and make the most money. It's free. Host a Zoom webinar. Invite your people to it. Wow. You, you like I've gotten more value from you than anybody else. I You are my only choice. Now I'm going to send this stuff out too. This is just having like some sort of a, you know, I'm sending them a text. Uh, I'm following up. I'm sending a handwritten note, you know, down here I have, this is actually like, this, this is, this is actually from Grant, but this I would never do, but there's literally like a 365 day follow-up plan of how to hit your lead. It's a lot, but maybe you can extract some of the stuff, right? Like an event invite, like we just talked about, um, a special gift to somebody, um, Hey, I just got this in the mail. Thought you might like it. Uh, hey, off market listing. Like, I, I never want to say I have buyers for your area if you don't have a buyer. So let's be honest with what you're doing. But if you really have a buyer interested in that price point, like I had a gentleman, um, I was looking for a house and he farmed the entire neighborhood with my information. Hey, I have a family of four, two kids, young teenagers looking to buy in equestrian manner. Uh, if you have something coming up that fits this kind of parameter, please let me know. He picked up two listings and none of them were to my criteria. But it was an honest reach out. It wasn't, I have a buyer, let me know if you're looking to sell. It was, I have a buyer and here's the family dynamic picture. Like I, I let him put a picture. Like He had a picture of my family in there. Now I did the same thing up in Pine Canyon and Flagstaff. I want a forest backing lot. I pulled all the title for this whole street, Soltaire Ave in uh, in Pine Canyon. 
And I pulled all the addresses and I sent them all notes with my picture. Had a guy hit me up and goes, I have my lot. I'm thinking about selling it. Now it was, it was 800 at the time. My wife's like, that's too much. And I'm like, oh no, babe, it's going to go up in value. She's like, no way. I could not sell her. I could not sell her on it. Um, anyone want to guess what it just sold for? 1.2. Higher. <laughs> Bro, she's like, oh, we should have got it. I'm like, well, I'm not going to say I told you so because I'll be sleeping on the couch, but I told you so, right? Um, I said, maybe you'll listen to me next time. All right, so some examples. Uh, when I text message, again, these are the ones that I haven't heard from, right? I put their name in a question mark. Like, have you ever gotten a text with your name in a question mark? You're like, yeah, that's me. Or they come back and they go, hey, I just got a new phone. Who is this? At least I got them to reply, right? There's a whole string of texts in there that they haven't replied to. And then I go, Helen, question mark. Or, hey, I've tried to reach you a few times. Have you given up on home buying? It's the takeaway. Have you given up on it? And they're like, no, I haven't given up yet. I'm not a quitter, right? They kind of get offended by it. I send the ghost emoji or I send two crickets. That's always a funny one. They're like, they're like, oh, that was a good one. Or they come back and laugh. I, again, I just want them to reply, right? Or the other takeaway, if I'm giving it, like some people don't want the to, to have the conflict or confrontation of, hey, I'm not looking right now. I'm not ready, you know, whatever, right? They don't want that. So I take that away from them and say, hey, it's all good. If interest has cooled, no worries. Let me know how you wish to proceed. So I put it on them and I, and I give them the, um, I lower that sense of defensiveness by saying, hey, Hey, if you're if you're good, if you're if interest is cool, no worries, no worries. Just let me know when you want to. What do you want to do next? Hey, what would be a good next step for us then? Do you want me to just wait ninety days? You want me to touch base in January? No problem. I just I need your word on something. If you change your mind, if someone you talking to a friend or coworker or Uncle Charlie and Uncle Charlie says you should buy a house, I want you to pick up the phone and call me and not wait till January when I'm going to call you. Does that sound good? Okay, like I need to have that conversation because I think we've all had it to where they've said, hey, I'm just going to wait until such and such. And you're like, okay. And then somehow you get an alert or something where it says they just closed. And you're like, oh my God, what do you mean? And then you call them and like, yeah, we just, we changed our mind. We figured we would do it. And, you know, I didn't want to call you. I just went to the new build myself. I didn't want to bother you. And you're like, no, you should have bothered me because I could have made 25%, <laughs> right? Okay, so the exercise down here is thinking about, and again, I'm going to send this to you, but what are some of the um, articles? What are some of the, like, again, I like chat GPT. I'm really diving in on it, but I could go into chat GPT and say, uh, write me the top five reasons to purchase a home in today's market. And it'll come up with benefits of home ownership. And then you could take that and go into Canva and go paste and create like a short little pamphlet that says, hey, I just wanted to send this to you. It's some of the benefits of home ownership right now. Or it could be the math, right? Household formations versus household creations. There's just not, there's like a 200,000 home gap that's not gonna get closed anytime soon that no one knows about. So where are these coming from? Keeping Current Matters is a great site. Housing Wire is a great site. You probably have stuff through your brokerage that comes through. So, but identify that and have that as a system, like part of your day needs to be mining for good articles. And I mean, part of it, like 10 or 15 minutes while you're drinking a cup of coffee in the morning, 10 or 15 minutes in the middle of the afternoon to take a break from stuff and go, I'm going to do a deep dive on some articles. I'm going to set my timer for 15 minutes and then I'm going to stop when I'm supposed to stop. So time blocking to do that kind of stuff. Now, number this, this exercise is who do you need to follow up on? And this is where we get into the categories. You have your leads, you have your people that are in process, like you have a buyer broker, have a contract, or they're a hot lead, like you're just waiting to get that, that listing appointment, or you've presented at the listing presentation, but I haven't locked up the listing agreement, right? So you have the ones that are kind of in process that you're working with, and then you have the closed. Then you also have what I call your VIPs. Your VIPs are your financial planners, your ex coworkers, your ex HR directors, your current HR managers that you may know or that your clients have as HR managers. Uh, the CPA that, I mean, literally, I had a guy, he referred a gentleman named Craig. Craig calls me and says, Hey, my CPA said I need to spend a million dollars in real estate between now and the end of the year. 
And I said, that's awesome, man. I got, I got two questions. Who's your CPA? Because I want to call him and make friends with him. And number two, why did he tell you that? And he said, well, because I'm either going to be exposed to a bunch of taxes and have to pay the government, or I buy real estate and pay myself. I said, I like that guy. So wouldn't we all like to have that CPA or five of them that think that way? So that would be another um, place I would put. So Sphere, VIPs, uh, those are people that we all need to follow up on. Okay, what stages are you following up on? So for me, it's they've inquired, so they're we're attempting to just contact them. So you send me a name and a phone number, and I've got a whole funnel of attempting to contact. Once I reach out, talk to them, then I have to get them to apply. So they're app pending. And then I have them as, I have their app, but I'm waiting on their documents. So I'm working on them, waiting on documents. And then there's pre-qualified. And then a subcategory to that is we did apply, but they had credit problems. So I put them on my credit team, which is a free service for them. And now I have that group to follow up on. So you, your goal with this sheet is to figure out what are the stages. So, you know, initial contact is in there, um, had the buyer broker agreement, had the listing appointment right? That would be in there. Um, in contract or in buyer broker. So they're in the car or the signs in the yard. And then in process, meaning it's um, their work, they're under contract for something. And then closed and beyond. Those would be some of the stages that I would think of, uh, but you might come up with more for, for you. And then what are the biggest takeaways today from follow-up? For me, it's always that one slide going back to where you have to have at least 12 touches. There has to be a minimum of 12 and then also the master trades. Those are my two biggest slides that I take away because, you know, yes, I like the do's and don'ts and, you know, never rely on one form of communication. But when I look at the master traits, that's where you're going to get the more the most bang for your buck because that's what I need to be. Hyper-organized, super patient, very strategic, time blocked like crazy. Um, if it's not in my time block, to, like, like today, from four to five, it says follow up on leads. And what I do is I call everyone that came in today. Like there could be people applying right now with Larry and Holly and then, and could have happened this morning as well. And then I'm going to call and be like the restaurant manager that circles the restaurant. Hey, David, glad you came in tonight. How is everything? How could we do it better? Cool. When are you going to be coming in again? Hey, between now and the next time you come in, David, can you do me a huge favor? Who else do you know that would enjoy my restaurant and my food? That's awesome. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Well, hey, I'm going to have them bring your favorite dessert over. Cool. Oh, you on 75 hard? I won't bring it. <laughs> Whatever. But it's it's that like that feeling of there's someone above that's coming in that's like, hey, how are we doing? What's going on? Cool. Kind of like authoritarian, but also very personable. And oh, hey, by the way, who else do you know that's looking to buy a house right now? We'd love to help them out. Oh, that's great. Hey, we'll just keep an eye out for me. I know you don't know anyone right now. It's okay. Right? All right. And then the last, what commitments will you make? Now I'll tell you the, the one commitment that, that needs to be made today is it putting in the time for yourselves to write out your follow-up plan. Like what is the plan? Like when the call comes in, this happens. I call, I text, I email, just the generic, what you're going to do and when. From there, it's, it's having that time blocked in the calendar of, okay, I'm going to pull this, um, you know, maybe it's Monday, I'm pulling the articles from the weekend. Or maybe it's Saturday, I'm pulling the articles to get ready. Um, it's could be looking for the homes in the area that you know your buyers would be looking or that you are farming. And so you're looking at those homes. So you have information to provide to that subdivision area, whatever. But I'm blocking time in my calendar to become the subject matter expert on whatever that is. I would highly recommend the Cromford report. If you go into the Cromford, he has the daily insights. You can literally pull off some of that stuff. And as long as you're reading it every day, like we have mortgage market guide, like MBS Highway, which is Barry Habib. He's like the oracle of mortgage-backed securities and interest rates in the market. So when I say household formations and creations and the 200,000, well, that's because I just watched Barry this morning and I know all the data. It'd be like watching Tina Tambor every single day. No different. So I want Tina and Michael Orr every day somehow in my calendar for five to 10 minutes that I'm just logging in and going, what did they say today? And that way I can have a very articulate conversation with my clients. And they're like, wow, that, man, that David really knows a lot of stuff. He, 
he knows more than the last three people that have been calling me, texting me, emailing me, whatever. And when you're curating your messages, it's catered for them. You're just going to convert the leads at a higher level. And that's the whole purpose for today was really to, for you to give you some ideas around the follow-up. But the next step is to take it one step further. And that's to figure out each of those categories of who are you actually following up with? And then what are the stages of the follow-up? And then what is that the written plan actually look like? Cool. Any questions? No questions for me. That was great, Greg. My big takeaway, yeah, the master traits that uh, note about recession, right? Besides 08, stable to increase in home values. So with where people are at, I feel like that would be a really great one for people who are on the fence. Oh, yeah. the rates and this and that. It's like, well, that's just one part of it, right? Um, and then, yeah, curating what you just said at the end, curating the message catered to them. So um, this was great. I'm looking forward to getting those uh, those slides and the recording and um, I'm going to write my plan. Good job, man. Good job. I actually have some slides too. I'll make a note. I'll send you the slides for that show the household formations and that recession. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Helen, how about you? Was this good for you? Yes, actually, it's a lot of reminders of the things that I know I have to do. And I've been doing things here and there, like uh, you say, just pop in there where they work or where they live. And I would say the same thing. Hey, I wasn't by the area, so I just want to drop something. Actually, I have something that I've been doing uh, this past week, and I really love it. Nice. So oh, you That would be a good one to drop <laughs> off. Heck, yeah, that's awesome. Oh, I might have lost you. Oh, I lost you. You can't see her, can you, David? Frozen. Frozen. Ah, uh, darn. Yeah. Well, that was a good, I mean, I like the unique gift. Doesn't look super expensive. Well, it looks expensive, but I think we both know it's not expensive. So I think that's a good one. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Sorry, it looks like uh, my internet is giving me a hard time today, so no I don't know why, but hey, I, I, I'm, you know, I will be appreciating if you send me the record video or the class. Yep, yep, I'll download it after <laughs> this, I'll send it out to you guys, but I appreciate Thank you making so time much. to come today, and I'm glad you got some value out of it. Yeah, definitely got some valuable value and some actionable ideas that I can, you know, put into uh, put into play right away. And I've got my time block tomorrow afternoon for follow up, so I'm going to make sure that I have a purpose when I love reach it. out to them, not just checking in. There you go, I love it. All right, guys, we'll enjoy the rest of your day. Awesome, thank you. You as well, Greg. Take care. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye. Bye.